the first um, section is about this problem of machine learning in adversarial environments. Um, so if you know anything about machine learning and in particular computer vision, sort of uh, deep neural networks have taken over computer vision and are able to solve a lot of tasks that uh, previously were seen difficult. And so for example, here we have a bunch of tasks, uh, six types of computer vision tasks that deep neural networks are really good at uh, doing. And so we have something like object classification where the goal is to say, okay, which object is in here? And you can imagine this is like a pedestrian detector. Um, or you could try localizing that object where you want to say, where is that pedestrian or person and give me a little bounding box around it. Um, similarly with like object detection, you can actually detect all of the objects in the, in the image. Uh, for example, there's two people here and then a vehicle. Um, and then there's more dense tasks where you try to say, can I label all of the pixels in that image? So here we see something like semantic segmentation where the color represents um, like a particular class. So here, like the blue is the vehicle. You can see the people are in red. And this is distinguished from something like instance segmentation where I actually wanna separate out, okay, there are two people here in the, in the semantic segmentation case, they would be labeled the same, but really um, semantically, these are two different pedestrians or people. So I should give them different labels. Um, and so also uh, DNNs have been shown to actually do more interesting tasks like key point detection. And so that's basically, I wanna say, given the people in the image, uh, label the individual parts of that person. And so there, you can go find a lot of literature on these tasks and at least right now, um, convolutional neural networks are very good at accomplishing tasks uh, uh, as in the literature. And so if you think about what it means to use a neural network, um, I like to think about it in terms of assets. And so the first thing you need to do is you need to go out there and actually train a neural network. And the way we do that is exactly what this sort of equation describes. I'm gonna go out and collect a bunch of data. I'm gonna go uh, essentially label that data, get ground truth for that data. And then I'm gonna go find some existing or create a new neural net architecture. And so something like ResNet or now transformers are all the, the hot rage right now. And then I'm gonna define some way to say, how does, um, given that network and some inputs, well, how does the air, what is the air between the output of that network and my ground truth label? So we call this a risk or a loss. And this is something usually like cross entropy loss if you're doing classification, or if you're doing regression, it might be something like mean squared error. And then I'm going to go use some optimization algorithm and you know everybody now pretty much uses mini batch stochastic gradient descent to do this. And what we're trying to do is say what are some parameters of this network this theta that minimizes this loss, so I want this loss to be really small. Uh, so that I learn some parameters of this function or you know like resnet to uh, so that it classifies our chain our outputs something given an input that matches what I labeled it as. Um, and so you could think about, given these assets, like an attacker could go and try to do something like um, influence your inputs. And so we call this poisoning in the literature. What I'm more interested in is what happens when you take a trained network and then deploy it in the real world. And so you can imagine if we want to do that, that's called usually called inferencing. And so I take my architecture, my inputs, and my trained parameters, and I use that to feed new inputs to that model, and I get some new outputs. And usually I do something with that output. Um, and again, when you look at these assets, it, you sort of have to think about what is the interesting thing an adversary can do with these assets. And so one thing they can try and do is um, steal this, these parameters of your model. And this really boils down in, in some sense to like an intellectual property threat where you know, if I go and deploy this network on like a, a medical scanner it may, another company may want to steal the parameters of this network so that they can use them themselves. And so that's an interesting threat, but it's not one that we're going to talk about today. If you have questions about it, uh, you can put them in the chat. What I'm more interested in is what happens if an adversary sort of changes the input to this network. And so the way we think about this is what happens if they small add a perturbation to the input. Um, and this class of threat is called an evasion attack. And so that's sort of what the subject of this talk will be today. So it turns out in the literature back in 2014 and even earlier, people have shown for at least deep neural networks and other types of machine learning models that it is possible to create these very small perturbations uh, 
um, here that are so small that you can't even really see them. And when you add these perturbations to an input, and then you take some off the shelf pre trained classifier, so like a ResNet or something like that, um, it will change the output of that um, input. And so here you could see had we normally had passed this image to this uh, classifier, it would have had output ALP by adding this very small perturbation. Here you can see it because I've sort of magnified the perturbation. Um, but when I add it to this ALP picture, it will change the classifiers up the C slug. And the same is true for this perturbation with this koala image. When I add it, this small, very small perturbation to the koala image, uh, the network sees it or the model sees it as a slide rule. And if you look very carefully, like at the C slug one, you can kind of see some differences between this image and the ALP image. Um, but it's much more difficult to see the differences between the slide rule and the koala. And so there's just something about these particular perturbations that are causing this model to um, be fooled. And so the goal uh, of GARD is to really understand why, why does this happen? What's going on here? And so it turns out, like what I talked about earlier, there's all these sort of visual tasks that neural networks can accomplish. Um, it's also true that you could apply very similar attacks, or attacks to those um, same tasks. So here showing that again, with a very small perturbation, this is amplified and I add it to this sheep image, I can cause this semantic segmentation model to go from sheep to, I think this red is car. So it would label these sheep as car. And it's, again, it's very difficult to see the difference between these two images visually, yet the classifier is fooled. And the same is true for like an object detection model where I can change the class of the sheep to a car. Um, okay, so the way we train these models is very important because you know, af when I go to deploy, I basically, or at least right now, I cannot change the parameters of the model, right? It, I'm sort of leaving them out there for the adversary to mess around with. And so if you think about how we train it, one, what we do is we, we again use this, um, sort of high level equation to do that. Um, and what I wanna convince you of is that the way we generate adversarial examples is the same way that we train neural networks. And so you can see that we do this risk minimization procedure to generate the parameters of a neural network. Um, and we could do something very similar, but instead of minimizing some loss, I will go and maximize that loss as an adversary. And instead of learning or changing the parameters of the network, I'll try to figure out how do I change the input? So adding some delta to it that maximizes this loss. And so you can imagine that I'm really using all of the same machinery that one would use to train a neural network to also attack it. And so that yield by doing this, you know, I can generate some very small perturbation, although it doesn't necessarily need to be small, but I can generate a perturbation that will cause this loss to be really high and therefore for example, change the classification in those examples that I showed. And so, yeah, again, we have the parameters, the architecture, some input that I want to change, um, my label, and then the loss that I, or risk that I want to, uh, let's just say, maximize. And, you know, I use gradient descent and I'll get a perturbation. So, uh, I should say too, the other thing, I've only been talking about visual tasks, but it is also true that this would um, cause, this, is, this issue is also true for other types of tasks. Like if you were doing audio classification or uh, language modeling, those kind of things, that this is general enough that we, uh, we could use these same attacks to attack those models. Um, it is an inter interesting question to say, are there um, certain features of different tasks, like audio, for example, that we could exploit to, to make them robust. But I think the, the research there, we don't know yet. Okay, so I'll pause if there are any questions, at least for the setting up of the problem, uh, if you wanna ask anything or put something in the chat. The next section is gonna talk about what do we do to sort of um, alleviate this problem. Okay, um, so the goal here is we're gonna we're gonna come up with or we sort of offer this idea called robust feature engineering, and so one of the data sets or the way Guard works is that there's sort of two teams. There's the people making defenses, and then there are the people who are attacking these models. And our goal as the defenders is sort of to create these robust models that the attackers will have a difficult time attacking. And 
in some cases, it's going to be possible for the attackers to always win, depending on the type of threat model that we're going to analyze. And we'll, I'll talk about that a little later. In some cases, it, they won't be able to win. And so guard is basically, OK, what are sort of what where on that spectrum can we be to understand you know, robustness, for example? And so in this particular case was one um, evaluation where we use this data set called UCF 101. And the goal of UCF 101 is to take uh, a video and then classify that into one of these 101 classes. And so you can imagine, you know, if you're staring at this video, you might go through and try to choose which uh, particular class this is. And I um, would guess that you probably would get it right that you would think that this is skiing. And because this black and white image, you know, it has a distinctive shape in motion. And our hypothesis here is that, you know, as humans, you don't necessarily have to see all this information, this background information here. You can see the distinctive motion and make a pretty good classification. So then what happens if we sort of ablate all of that information that you would normally feed a model and instead feed it sort of these binary images. And so that's just one sort of special case of um, what we call robust features, where you can take the image and uh, sort of binarize it into black or white pixels. Uh, the other thing you do is something like background ablation, where I take that same mask, but instead of treating the input as black and white pixels, I can sort of uh, get rid of the background information or I can turn it into a little more information where I say I'll color the pixels based on some semantic meaning. So here, like that purple would be skis and the real red is a person. And we can also do something like with using um, detection or key point detection models where we actually extract the uh, human key points because one of the features of UCF 101, if I go back to the previous slide, is all of these classes are humans doing some action with some object or with another human. And so having key points for people is, seems like it would be a, a feature that is useful for a model to use. Okay, so, so we could take this um, idea and say, we'll go and extract these quote unquote robust features. And here, for example, we'll do some like foreground ablation. And the goal here is saying, or the, the point of this is to show like if you were to guess this label, you probably wouldn't be able to tell a priori what this um, particular example is. Um, but if I did the opposite and I ablated the background, you definitely probably could tell that this is um, applying lipstick or apply lipstick. And so there's something about, uh, at least for us as humans, you know, you know, we're sort of ignoring the background and, and focusing on some salient um, features. Um, but sometimes that context matters. And so, for example, here, we could say, if I've had these three pedestrians in a scene, and I say, if I asked you, okay, what are the heights of these pedestrians? You might say, they're all the same height. And here, this bounding box is, I'm shifting it to show you, like, they're pretty much the same size. But if I were to change the context, then you might be surprised and be like, okay, actually, I think this person is much taller than these other people. And it's only because that context changed that you're sort of brain perceives this differently. It turns out that neural networks do not work this way. Um, and so what we can do is we can take an off the shelf classifier. So for this uh, UCF 101 data set, and we can, you know, it does really well on the inputs. So we could say, get, here's all the original inputs to that model. And when we go and measure the accuracy of this classifier, so how well it will classify individual videos as whatever action of those 101 actions, it will do that really well, so 94% accuracy. And then we can go through with that same data set, uh, get rid of all the background information by ablating it. And when we ask the classifier to classify those examples, the accuracy drops considerably, like almost half. And so, uh, or more than half, this, and this is bad, right? Because you wouldn't expect it to um, drop so much when you get rid of information like this. Like it shouldn't be overfitting in some sense to the background pixels. And the weird thing is, or the even weirder thing is when you go and for, uh, ablate the foreground pixels, the accuracy is really high. It's higher than when you back, uh, ablate the background pixels. And so 
in some sense, this classifier has learned to use the background context to classify the action. And in some cases, this actually makes sense. If you go through the UCF 101 data set, you can look at it and say, oh yeah, if I see a pool, then I know it's probably gonna be the swimming action. Um, here it's, you know, the, it's a little more hand wavy, like why should a door and some other stuff be discriminative to applying lipstick? Um, however, there could be movement in this mass. So this is a, a little more complicated, but it, it, it feels like it should not be able to classify this action very well. And yet it does, it, it achieves 66% accuracy. And so the way we're going to model this is if we take our standard training procedure again, where we're trying to minimize some loss, um, we're going to add in some function to our input uh, that sort of extracts either semantically or spatially or temporally meaningful features. So like the background ablation or something like um, the uh, semantic segmentation. So we provide it semantically meaningful pixel values or key points, for example. And so this is what we call robust feature engineering. And so one type of, I guess, robust feature engineering or one way of thinking about this is, is um, what is currently the state of our, the art defense against these evasion attacks. And the state of the art um, defense is called adversarial training. And adversarial training is a very simple idea, um, although very difficult to execute. What you do is when you're training your network, you're also gonna generate adversarial examples at the same time, and you're gonna train on those adversarial examples. So this is basically saying, I will learn how to change my input using some attack, and then I will train on those uh, perturbed inputs. And it turns out that this defense does the best out of any defense that we know of. Um, and our goal is saying, you know, this, procedure because our training is within a loop and this is also a loop. This is very expensive to run. Um, and so can we somehow do as well as this, but not incur the cost to, uh, that it takes to actually compute or train a network in this way? Um, and it also like there are some theoretical results showing that when you do adversarial training, it may not be possible to always account for all threat models because um, there may be some orthogonality between different threat models. And so ideally, we, or this is the state of the art defense, but ideally we don't do this. Um, at least I, when I think about it, I don't see humans learning in this way. Like we're not learning um, adversarial or we're, we don't have perturbations coming into us where we're sort of trying to account for some adversary manipulating our input. And so there must be something else that we need to do when we're training these uh, models. And so our idea is again, to sort of extract features from the input that we think are discriminative for whatever task you're working on. And again, going back to UCF 101, this is something like we can take an instance segmentation network, which is uh, a type of object detector and extract these uh, semantic masks or we could, again, also use an object detector with that can deduct key points from an input. And so here we're just sort of visually showing what these look like. And you could see like even here, if I only had these um, key points, I probably could discriminate what this class is. Like I could tell that that's skiing. And here, if I saw this person with, you know, every now and then we see skis as the label here, I could probably, the model could easily discriminate. Okay, this is a person ski. Um, and so the natural question here is why bother even using object detectors? And so, well, there's a natural, there's a good reason here. Um, if we use like a classifier to extract these features, which is what normally what people do, um, it's hard to know like what's in this, op what's in like an image like this where there's no salient object, right? So here, when we pass this image into a classifier, it, it does see that there's like a notebook in here. I don't know about a joystick or a mouse. Maybe these can, one of these can be interpreted as a pomegranate and there perhaps is a desktop here, but there's no like, I don't know where these objects are in the image. And in fact, when I add a perturbation to this input, like I can confuse it really easily so much so that it, it sees a baboon. And I don't think there's a baboon in here. At least I don't see one. Um, and that's bad. 
However, uh, I can also, instead of just changing the input slightly, I can add this patch. And so here we take a patch where we can, the adversary can modify the pixels to any amount uh, that they want. Um, and by doing that again, we can cause this uh, classifier to see basically only an orange. And maybe this is a correct classification because this thing is very salient. And so I should say this is an orange. But ideally we would see the other things like we, it, it does not see, well, it sees the notebook, but it's very low confidence, so much so that it's just in the noise. Um, but if I apply an object detector to the same image, you know, it, it could still see everything. It says, oh yeah, there's a dining table here, there's oranges here and a laptop. And so it has this nice, nice property by virtue of the, at least a, some types of object detectors that they can uh, localize these classifications without being sort of perturbed by some patch attack that we see here. And so when we do this and take these, um, take the, our, our robust features approach and apply it, uh, our goal is then, okay, first we wanna see, does this significantly change the accuracy of our underlying model? Because we're not, well, we do have to retrain the underlying model that we get from, um, that we receive because we're changing the input, but uh, we wanna know, are we gonna decrease the accuracy of that classifier as a result? And so if you take like a baseline classifier where it just receives these RGB video inputs, you know, it, it does pretty well. It, it hits 77% accuracy. And then when we apply our defenses on top of that, so we either do like background ablation or we change the input to have semantic segmentation type inputs, or we just have black and white videos, or we do the key point detection, uh, we don't really lose too much accuracy from the baseline. The, skeletonization or the where we do the key point detection seems to lose more accuracy. And uh, the reason there is it may be that the type of we had to change the model here for this particular um, input significantly because we just have key points we don't have images anymore and so we had to use something like a graph neural network. But in, in these other three cases like they maintain enough accuracy compared to the baseline. And so the next thing we can do, so this is great, right? We've maintained the accuracy or get nearly the same accuracy. What happens if we apply an attack? And attacks, if you've read any of the literature are sort of very difficult to execute, especially with something as complicated as this. Um, but in some sense, they all require the same thing in that if I can train this network end to end, then I should also be able to attack it end to end. And I need to compute um, a gradient all the way from the outputs, which again tells me, or I need to compute a gradient so that I say, I wanna change this input so that it goes to a different class. And so I need a gradient to flow all the way through uh, my original classifier back to the input through my robust feature extractor, which is an object detection model. And then, or yeah, through my robust feature extractor and then to an object detection model, which is helping extract those features back to the original input. And so this can be a difficult thing to do because it's very easy to put operations in here that would cause this gradient to um, not uh, be useful to changing this input. And this is what often happens if you read the literature that somebody will come up with the defense and you know, say, hey, look at this works. And then somebody else will come along and say, well, if we had changed this one operation you use because that operation is uh, non-differentiable and we had made it differentiable or, or used a um, approximation of that operation that is differentiable. Look at, I can reduce the efficacy of your defense, you know, back down to whatever the efficacy of the original classifier was. And so we end up spending a lot of time trying to figure out, okay, how can we make this gradient flow back to the input? And all of this machinery in here makes this difficult, but because we have a lot of experience with attacking this networks, I feel like we're often better than um, uh, other people are at uh, when they go to defend these types of networks. And if you know anything about object detectors, there are some non-differentiable components in here. And so we have to take care, we, we take uh, a lot of care when we essentially try to um, compute this gradient through these things. But we can do that. And so what we can do is again, go measure our baseline model compared to our defenses. 
And so our, if we look at the baseline model, and here we're showing what is the robustness, so the accuracy of these models under attack versus if I allow the adversary to change the input more and more, so as we go to the right. And so you can imagine, like, if I say uh, the, the attacker's strength is at one, that means they can change any pixel by at most one value. And then if I go up to 128, so I say you can change the value of any pixel by 128, they essentially control the whole input. And so you would expect that at this such high values, the attacker is always going to win because they can basically replace the input with whatever they want. Um, and if they don't win, then that's probably a sign that your defense is doing something weird. Um, and you should go basically go back and check is your gradient flowing correctly? Are you using some weird um, operation that's causing the gradient to not be uh, useful? And so the baseline model basically looks this curve as you increase the attacker strength quickly goes down and you know hits zero. And this is normal for most models. Like it, uh, when I apply these type of um, attacks, or when we apply these type of attacks to models, we you know the curves just drop very quickly. And so, however, if you use our defenses and trust that we implemented a gradient well enough so that we can compute these attacks, um, we see curves that look like this. And so these are still not great, but at least we're seeing some improvement over the baseline that by uh, training on these robust or training these models on these robust features, we're seeing a non-trivial increase in the robustness of these models. Um, but to be frank, like I wish that you know, at these higher perturbation strengths around like 16 or 32, that we would see uh, greater than, you know, random chance on the, the inputs. But here we're sort of in the noise, or at least it's hard to say that we gained any real robustness at these higher epsilon values, these attacker strength values. Um, and so if you go and analyze this, or what we did is we can then go and analyze, okay, what what is causing this object or our robust features approach um, to fail. And so this video is a little uh, flashy. And so what's happening is when we go and visualize what these attacks are doing to our robust features, they end up doing things like this. And so it turns out, and we sort of predict, predicted this from the beginning that the object detector we're using, you know, is not special. Um, it's It was taken off the shelf and there is no reason a priori to sort of believe that it would be robust. And so if I go back, like when we're computing this gradient flow, even if this part were, or, um, we implemented this correctly, when I go back and, and compute an error or a gradient through this object detector, and this isn't robust, and we're hoping this is robust, well, I'm sort of like, uh, relying upon or sort of crossing my fingers and hoping this object detector is robust. And it turns out it's not. Uh, and we knew this and, but so then, but at least this sort of changes the game because we know that we can make, or we can generalize just as well. So even if we use these quote unquote robust features, we could still do um, or perform really good classification, but, and we have some robustness and so this tells us, well, what happens if we change this object detector? Or can, is there some way to make the object detector robust that we use to extract these uh, robust features? And so we sort of moved it to a different part of the model in some sense, which is good and bad, but I think it's fine. And so one way to make object detection robust uh, that we've been uh, working on more recently is through uh, multiple, multiple modalities. And so when you have multiple modalities, and so here you can imagine something like uh, I have an RGB input, and then I have some depth image to go with that RGB input. Um, the way people combine these in the literature is through some fusion technique. And so with an object detector, you know, I'm going to compute some features of this input. I'm going to take uh, those features, and then I'm going to produce labels and bounding boxes for it. Um, so that's the normal way of just uh, doing object detection or semantic segmentation or other things like that. Um, but if I have an alternate modality like depth, then I can play um, a more interesting, or I can use this a modality in a more interesting way. And so this is something we call semantic fusion. 
And so semantic fusion is basically this idea that, you know, if I have a depth image, then it's pretty easy for me to localize objects within this depth image. And it turns out that for certain types of object detectors, um, they have this nice operation called region, region of interest pooling. And so what this does is it says, um, given some proposal, so like some region that you're interested in, I'll crop my inputs to that region. And because we have a depth image that is very discriminative for object shape, I can then use that to produce proposals. And so that's what this image is showing that you can see all these bounding boxes are around basically objects that are interesting, like the car here, this person on a motorcycle and these traffic lights. It sees some extraneous things, but what we're hoping is when we uh, send these proposals back into our uh, original object detector that you know it's gonna ignore certain parts of the image. And you could see here on the right, if we had an adversarial patch in the image, which is this thing right here, you know, there's no proposal around it. So we have, so there's no reason that this object detector should be fooled by this particular patch. And in fact, it's not, right? It, it's cropping or it's receiving these proposals and cropping to these proposals so that it, this patch basically will never influence the detection of any particular object. And so this is just one way of making an object detector robust by using multiple modalities. Um, one, I guess, criticism of this approach is that, well, you, you're using a depth image and that's not very realistic. And yes, I agree. Um, and so we're trying to figure out, is there ways of extracting depth from, for example, like uh, stereographic images? So if I had two RGB inputs that are offset by some distance, could I compute depth? And would that be robust? Or could I use that new, that computed depth image to uh, discriminate where objects are in the scene? And so the, the semantic fusion approach is what we're currently pursuing in for the next phases of this guard project. And there are other, you can imagine there are other ways of doing this as well, but this is just one approach. Okay, and so we can go and measure the robustness of this semantic fusion approach. And it turns out that given some baseline model, if we uh, don't use semantic fusion, this model does well, even under attack. Um, but when we en enable our semantic fusion approach, we can um, do pretty well. We can, at least for this upper um, part of the table, we can reduce the number of hallucinations that this, uh, that this particular attack uh, produces. And I should probably explain what a hallucination is. So if you were to go and not use this semantic fusion approach, you would start to see a bunch of detections on this patch. So it'd start seeing things. It would hallucinate objects around the patch. And that's what this number is saying, that it's saying for every image, it's hallucinating at least one object and it's on that patch. But because of our semantic fusion approach, we can reduce that number significantly such that it doesn't, it almost rarely hallucinates an object. Um, we can also go and improve the baseline using standard tricks. And this is more interesting, I think, because here we don't, uh, this previous baseline was um, taking these two modalities and fusing to them together, not using semantic fusion, using something, another type of fusion technique. But if we just train on RGB inputs and uh, use that model, then we can, that uh, quote unquote improved baseline does better in terms of uh, benign accuracy. So this is AP50, which is just a measure of object detectors, but as the higher this number is, the better. So we improve it over the baseline, the accuracy of this model. Um, and then when we run the attack against this model, it, the accuracy decreases more because it doesn't have that depth information integrated into it yet. And in fact, that causes the number of hallucinations to go up. So this model is uh, more accurate, but less robust. But then when we add on our semantic fusion technique, we can basically improve it across the board. So we maintain the accuracy of the classifier. Our adversarial accuracy is basically the same as our um, original non or our generalizing how, how well our um, baseline generalizes and the number of hallucinations uh, is significantly reduced. And so this is a better representation, I guess, of what semantic fusion is doing. 
it's improving the baseline significantly, and um, or at least it's maintaining the accuracy of the original baseline and improving the robustness of it of it as well. And so the sort of ex explanation for why this is happening is is um, shown by these figures. And so if you look at what a classifier or something like what is called a dense object detector is doing or a single stage object detector is doing, um, what matters is something called a receptive field. And so if you, if you know anything about how convolutional neural networks work is that at the end of your outputs, those outputs basically see a part of the image. And so you can imagine if I have an output here or if I wanted to classify this pedestrian and I look at a classifier, its receptive field, the number or the size of the input that it's going to take into account is very large. And so what this means is as an attacker, I can basically have some patch in the image. And as long as that patch is within the receptive field, it's going to affect the classification or detection of this pedestrian. On the other hand, something like a sparse object detector, where it's doing that region of interest cropping mechanism, that the receptive field is much smaller. Um, and so that's going to require the attacker to move this little patch closer to the object of interest. And in fact, almost always it needs to overlap this object of interest, which from my perspective is a much different threat than, um, than this type of threat. Ideally, our models would not or would be robust to patches that are not near objects of interest. But if I have a patch over an object, I'm always going to be able to win as the attacker because I can essentially manipulate um, the output uh, to, or I can manipulate an object to be whatever ob other object I want it to be. And I'll have examples of that a little bit later. Okay, so that is why. Um, we think that these sparse object detectors, and so normally there's something called like faster RCNN are more robust. And if you apply this semantic fusion technique described here, you can uh, create uh, decently robust um, object detectors, which then we think we could be used with our robust features approach to um, solve, well not solve, but provide a solution that can uh, mitigate a certain class of threats. And the, the, the certain class of threat we're actually interested in for the most part are these patch attacks. Um, when I sort of set up the problem, I talked about adding a uh, perturbation to the whole image, but um, there's reasons why we think that's not super realistic, which I'll get into in this next section. And so, now, so we've done a lot of work on understanding this robust features approach and what we call semantic fusion using multiple modalities to robustify object detectors. Um, however, there's one issue with the way we currently evaluate adversarial examples. And what we're gonna do or what I wanna show and or prove to you is that we need to use simulation to start evaluating um, these evasion attacks. And so simulation is nice because it, it gives us a lot of data that we can use to sort of train these classifiers or detectors. Um, it gives us data in terms of um, multiple modalities. So I can extract depth images from it. I can extract different perspectives of objects if I wanted to. Um, and then it also gives us the ability to sort of automate supervision. And so here we have like a dense labeling of the image where every pixel is labeled with a particular class. And so this is a great example, or this is, these are great features of simulation because I no longer have to go out and collect data. And right now, like with, for example, with ImageNet and other data sets, you know, they're sort of um, using other people's work. Like a lot, the ImageNet, for example, is basically Flickr photos that pe other people have captured with their cameras. And then they went and labeled them or used mechanical turkers to go and label those images. And that, so that requires a lot of, um, work done by people to go and label that stuff and collect that data. By using simulation, we don't have to do any of that. We can essentially program our way into data sets to create synthetic data sets. And uh, uh, one of the issues people have identified with doing this, you know, it's great in terms of cost, but then it's not always the case that going from simulation to the real world is possible. So if I were to train a classifier or detector on simulated data, that doesn't necessarily mean it will work on real data. 
And I think this is fine. That's, interest, that's an interesting use case if you want to do that. But for our purposes, we're more interested in what happens if I apply adversarial attacks to simulated data. We don't, applying adversarial attacks in the real world is very difficult. And this is why. So when you think about uh, like your, uh, um, some cyber physical system, like an autonomous car, usually uh, you can imagine, right? This autonomous car is gonna do a lot of stuff. It, is, it will have some sensor that's gonna capture, you know, what the real world is doing. It's gonna take that sensor data, pre-process it in some way. So um, for example, it may not even sense all colors. It, will, it might just sense red for, because stop signs here are red. Um, and then it will use, eventually it will pass that onto some model to do something interesting. So like recognize stop signs in this case. And when you look at how all of the, or a lot of the existing literature evaluates a, a system like this and attacks on that system, what they're gonna do is they're gonna add some digital perturbation to this uh, pre-processing step, basically. Um, and our contention is that, well, that doesn't make sense because if the adversary can add a perturbation at this stage in this car system, well, then why couldn't they just change this model? Like there's no reason they couldn't do that if they're already inside of this uh, system. This box here represents the system. And so they don't, if they have access, they can control anything they want anyways, they're not gonna add a small perturbation to the input. Um, and so this doesn't make sense, at least for these types of systems, like these cyber physical systems. And I think there are a lot of existing security mechanisms that one could use to sort of harden the exterior of this system. What the adversary can do is what we call realizable perturbation. So they can essentially manipulate the environment. Um, we have very little control over the environment or a lot of the time, like it's hard to control what the environment looks like and so, for example, an adversary could sort of change the stop sign in the real world. And then when your sensor looks at that stop sign, it might be fooled. And so these, these, these realizable attacks are the type of attack that we actually care about. And so if you think about this sort of uh, mathematically, right now, when we uh, run these digital perturbations, what's happening is, you know, we, somebody has collected this data set using like a camera like if they're Flickr photos, right? I use an iPhone camera or some Nikon camera to capture the data set. And that's represented by this H of X where X is like the real world um, that I'm sensing. And we always add these digital perturbations on top of that already sensed input. And so that's what a digital perturbation is. But ideally, if you're wor more worried about like these cyber physicals or threats against these cyber physical systems, you want this perturbation to be um, on top of the, you want this perturbation to modify the environment and then to be sensed. And so this, this is a sort of mathematical representation of the difference between a digital perturbation and a realizable perturbation. And so a lot of the literature will focus on these types of attacks, these digital perturbations, because they're easy to execute. Whereas it's much more difficult to execute these types of attacks. And the reason for that is because if you were to go ex to execute this type of attack, you're, you don't, you need to essentially model the real world. Um, and so doing that is hard because um, even if I were to generate such a perturbation, I then need to manufacture that perturbation. So here, like in this case, we had to print these um, stop signs out or uh, send this picture off to a 3D or a digital uh, t-shirt printer so that they could actually print a t-shirt out with this perturbation on it. And that just takes a long time, you know, to go through that iteration process, right? It, it, when I generate these perturbations, I'll, I don't know if they're adversarial until I actually manufacture them. Um, and so I have, I as the attacker have to take into account, like what are the, all the possible things that could possibly happen when a sensor uh, senses my perturbation. And so the nice thing is when you use simulation, it's much easier to basically uh, understand whether the perturbation you're going to generate as the attacker will become adversarial. And so uh, that is the central reason why we think that using simulation is just a better means to understand this because A, you can control the environment uh, uh, more closely and that you can actually test your adversarial examples very quickly. 
And so a good example is like when we were running this particular attack where we changed a stop sign to look like a sports ball, um, it took a long time to figure out, okay, well, how do we train, change this procedure here to account for something like weather? And I, I remember when the first time our student, our intern actually tried this, the, he said that the, the, a cloud had started to cover the sun and that stopped this stop sign from being um, adversarial. And so essentially we didn't take into account, you know, changes in lighting within this uh, uh, H function that we developed. And the same thing with this uh, bird t-shirt. I We had to go through a lot of iterations to figure out, okay, what is, when I generate a perturbation, you know, I, it's not always gonna be uh, printed on a t-shirt in the same way. And so you have to figure out how do you account for that? And that it, it's a very, it, this took a long time to, to do. It was like on the order of six months <laughs> and similar for this attack. And so that it just took a, going through these iterations is time prohibitive and cost prohibitive. And so using simulation would significantly uh, increase our ability to understand models and um, make it more reproducible as well. And so, okay, so the, so we talked about how to, or we, I show examples of these attacks working. And so now, assuming we were to move to simulation and we are moving to simulation, um, how would we attack this? And so there's this um, uh, line of research called differentiable rendering, essentially, that we can use to create these uh, realizable attacks. And so differentiable rendering is basically this idea that given some loss, I can uh, propagate that loss all the way through some rendered image. So like here's a rendered image of a pineapple back through the renderer itself. And I can compute a gradient essentially with respect to any one of these four things. So normally, right, I can change like the texture of the object. So I could say, tell me how to change the texture of this object to make it adversarial, quote unquote adversarial. But I could also say, tell me how to change the mesh of that object to make it adversarial as well. And so uh, this technology called differentiable rendering enables this or enables us to do this. And there are a lot of reasons why this is hard that I'm not gonna explain, but um, there's a really good YouTube video explaining all of the capabilities here. And so this technology called differentiable rendering enables us basically to compute these types of attacks uh, somewhat efficiently. It's definitely more efficient than uh, doing these physical, physically realizable attacks where we're actually manufacturing t-shirts and stop signs. And so, okay, so how does this work? Well, if you know anything about how rendering works, typically you have a mesh. So this is like a bunch of triangles specifying an object and here we're showing a pedestrian. And then there's some way to map these 2D textures onto this mesh and that's called a UV map. And what, what this is essentially doing is saying for each of these triangles, how do I color it in a certain way? And so differentiable or rendering allows us to go all the way back to this texture map such that I can manipulate the texture map so that when it's rendered, it looks adversarial. And here we show an example of a car um, moving down the way and you could see, uh, let's see if it plays again. It sees it as a car way down there. So our attack isn't super effective when it's far away, but up close it is. Whoops. Yeah, it sees it as a train here and then, oh, it's not playing. and then it sees it as a handbag as it gets further away, then it doesn't see it, and then eventually it sees a car. Um, so this technology differentiable rendering is, has enabled us to at least compute attacks, and, or more, I guess a better way of saying it is more efficiently evaluate whether our defenses are working um, against these realizable attacks. And so this is where we are right now, at least within the guard program, where we're now uh, able to take attacks that we sort of digitally generated using some procedure um, and then re-import them back into the simulator we're using. Uh, the particular simulator we're using is called Carla, uh, which Intel helps develop. Um, and it's based on the Unreal 4 engine. Okay, so that's an example. Or So now I wanna show like why um, patch attacks can be difficult to execute. And so I'm gonna show this through an example. So the goal here is we're, we're gonna take an image and then just have a 
a classifier classify this image. And so if you take that, it says, oh, this is a tiger cat, which is correct. Um, what I can do is then apply a patch to this image. And I'm going to use differentiable rendering to say, um, I want to render this patch onto this image. And then I want to compute uh, how to change the location of this black patch to make this thing adversarial. And so if you had to guess, like, um, beforehand, like where would you place this patch to cause this classifier to change its um, classification from tiger cat to something else? And so you might guess that, well, it should place this patch like right over the tiger cat. And so we can show this like um, as we move this patch around using differentiable rendering, uh, a loss that we compute through the differentiable render, it's slowly moving this thing around and eventually, it, you'll see that it will move this patch to be directly on top of the tiger cat. There, it kind of over or flew past it, then got over. And you'd be right. Like when I place this black patch on top of this cat, it does see it as something else—a golf ball. Again, it's probably taking into some context here that you know this is. There's a bunch of green around here, and there's I don't know, a black blob in the middle for some reason is a golf ball. Um, and so this shows why like it took a long time for that patch to basically become adversarial or to move to the right position to be adversarial. And the reason for this is, um, or the nice thing we can do is actually go compute, okay, what is the loss at, at every position of this patch? And you could see that uh, this loss is, or there's a lot of like um, uh, local minima, or I guess local maxima in this case. Right, that if I start in some edge over here, and as I follow this lost landscape, I might get to this point. And depending on you know the parameters of my attack, would I escape this maxima? Don't know. Like that's a that's one of the arts of training neural networks is you know you don't want to get stuck in some I guess in for neural training in some minima, and in in the, this case in some maximum since I'm trying to maximize the loss. Um, so moving this patch is, it's hard to navigate this loss landscape essentially. Um, but you can see there, there does exist um, a point here where it maximizes the loss, but because it's not super convex, there's a lot of little mac little hills around this bigger hill, you know, I could easily get stuck in there. And so this is the primary reason why differentiable rending is hard, is a difficult task. But Luckily, we can rely upon others to sort of figure out, okay, how can we make this uh, lost landscape more smooth? Okay, so that's about most of our, all of my talk. And so I hope that I've at least convinced you that um, machine learning models are vulnerable to these evasion attacks, um, that depending on if uh, certain classes are, for certain classes of uh, threats, it may be possible to defend against these. And the, the type of threat we're more very interested in is, are these realizable examples shown on the right, where you know I have a patch on top of some um, object. And that uh, if I want to go and evaluate these types of threats, where I have these patches on objects, that we really need to be using simulation because manufacturing t-shirts like this is hard. And so that's my talk, I can now take questions. Great, well, thank you very much, Corey. This is, uh, this is a really interesting topic. Um, I'm not seeing uh, questions yet in the chat. Uh, we've got time for a few, and I wanted to point out we're uh, fortunate to have a number of uh, uh, good audience here, including our Associate Dean for Research, Dr. Antonia Jetter, and our Dean of the College of Engineering and Computer Science, uh, Dr. Wu Chi Feng, who's also a faculty member in the CS department. So um, I'll kick it off and ask uh, a, a more conceptual question. I mean, sure. uh, you did your uh, PhD work at Dartmouth and now you're working in a corporate research lab for Intel. Can you comment on how life is different in the corporate research lab and how you how you're liking that yeah um so when i joined intel and then i put in a few years i i would get asked that question a lot too and the way i would explain it at least to graduate students we were trying to recruit that you know i feel like a graduate student that's paid better um <laughs> and so that's good i think um 
And it, as I've sort of progressed at Intel as well, it, it still feels that way, to be honest. Um, it, I feel like we have a lot of freedom, at least within Intel labs to do kind of this interesting research. Um, I think if you think about this, like what is the business proposition of this particular work? It's not really clear, but I think Intel at least believes like artificial intelligence and machine learning are definitely the future of where we want to go. And so understanding um, the sort of vulnerability or robustness of these models is important. Um, and you can imagine like this type, uh, you don't even have to execute these types of threats that I described, but there are going to be sort of benign things in your data set that cause it to, um, to mess up. And so one of the hypotheses we have is that by concentrating on these adversarial examples and invasion attacks in particular, that you can actually make your model more robust to other types of benign corruptions that exist already in your data set. And so that's how I sort of explain our research. And um, I guess getting back to your question, I, I, uh, being able to focus on that longer term research agenda I, it has been, or at least it, it feels similar to academia in a lot of ways. And, but you know, being in business also has its own challenges. Okay. And, uh, uh, Dr. Benjamin Parker, uh, another uh, a, a graduate of the PSU uh, math department, um, asked what techniques are used to smooth out the landscape, so to speak, of the objective function? Similarly, how would you kick yourself out of a local minimum you want to avoid or end up stuck in? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so when we think about differentiable rendering, so uh, let me go back here. So when I, the when I apply this patch right here, what happens is uh, there's a sharp discontinuity between the patch and then sort of the, the original background pixel. And so what end up what people end up actually doing is they sort of uh, interpolate between this discontinuity. So they assume there's some linearity between them. And that seems to work. It definitely smooths out this lost landscape a lot, or enough that you can compute uh, an adversarial example more quickly. And then, um, but you know that's not going to change everything. And so the the way so if you go and train neural networks normally, you're going to encounter this issue anyways. Like there are going to be local minima that you'll fall into. And so the black art of training neural networks is really okay. How do I change my learning rate schedule so that if I were to fall into these examples, you know, I'll jump out very quickly. Or how do I change my uh, optimizer to take into account more information, like uh, sort of maybe second derivatives so that it can get out of uh, saddle points or local minima. Um, all that same research applies here too. And so that, that's sort of the one thing I want people to take away is that if you can train a neural network, you can also attack it and you can also bring all of that existing stuff uh, into your attack toolkit to make your attacks better. Great. Um, Banefsha, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question yourself. Well, thank you so much for your uh, great talk. So my question is, what if like the adversarial attacks attack different uh, data modalities, for example, depths, RGB, like at the same time? So do you think like in this case, your proposed semantic fusion approach would work? That's a good question. So yeah, we're actually looking at this right now. And I think if there's something qualitatively different, and I don't have a good um, example of this, about depth, I think, in, in particular. Uh, if you look at, if I zoom in on these depth images, they, the boundaries between objects is definitely easier to discriminate uh, compared to RGB, right? And so I think if we were to train on these or, or play some trick about the way we train networks, I think we, it feels like we can make depth net, or networks trained on depth modalities more robust than RGB information. It's just, that's my feeling. We don't current, that's what we're actually working on right now. Like how can we show that these depth, our networks trained on depth modalities are actually more robust. Yeah. That's my sense. <laughs> I don't know, but I definitely agree. The other thing, um, when you compute attacks on depth, it's not easy in the sense that um, I can say that, fine, I can place a patch in this depth image and cause a pixel to have a different depth, but then would that be physically realizable? And I don't know. Uh, like if I were to say, oh, this patch you know, caused a pixel at infinity, well, 
what does that mean? I guess it means I have a hole now in my object. And so then I would have to put a hole in that object. Or if I had a depth that says, I'm gonna add five meters to your object. Uh, well, that's like a five meter protrusion coming off like a stop sign. Would that make sense? I don't know. And so I think there's at least two um, things to understand here is one, when I create these perturbations on depth, would I actually be able to manufacture those? Uh, my sense is no. And then um, there's something about depth that I think is much easier or should be more robust than training on RGB images. Yeah, Hopefully okay, that helps you yeah, answer the question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So one more question. So do you think if your approach might work like on other types of adversarial attack? So, like what? Like audio or what are you thinking of? No, like for example, boundary attack or like different types of attacks, not only for example, this evasion attack. Like this, this extracting robust features because it's really cool and a great approach. So I was wondering. Yeah, I'm trying. So you, by boundary attack, do you mean like something where I change the outside of the pick the? Yeah, way? yeah. For example, you know, different types of, for example, black box attacks, white box attacks, or like different types of like attack attacks, like um, not only yeah. for example. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. Let me see. So, okay, when I think about attacks, like if you read the literature and it seems like you're somewhat familiar with the literature, that there's a lot of um, talk about, or we give attacks different names. And my belief is, and having done this for a while, is that, you know, these attacks, it doesn't really matter what we do. What we care about is can we compute a gradient that tells us how to generate this um, particular perturbation or delta in this case. Um, how you accomplish that is an interesting question, but oftentimes what it comes down to is do I, can I compute a gradient that is informative enough to actually cause this loss to be maximized or minimized if you're doing like a targeted attack, for example. Um, and maybe there is something different about black box attacks, but it feels like, you know, computing gradients has been very successful. <laughs> We're just training neural networks, and it feels like we should just be using "quote unquote" white box attacks. Assuming, in, I, I guess, that makes the assumption that the adversary sort of knows everything about your network, which is a good security assumption, right? Um, and so, I think it then comes down really to: Are you computing a good gradient? And then it doesn't matter what attack you run; they're all going to more or less perform the same. Um, they're going to generate similar deltas, I guess, at the end of the day. Um, but there is a difference between like um, applying some small unseeable patch or perturbation versus a patch attack because it's you know attacker it, you're saying something different about what the attacker controls and in some cases or at least I contend that you know adding these small deltas to images is interesting I think academically or theoretically but what we actually care about are these patches on top of images or inserted into simulation or in the real world, because again, you don't control the environment as the defender. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Okay, we have time for a couple more. And so uh, uh, Dr. Weber asked, uh, when will AI become smarter than people and how scary is that? I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, there, you, you'll read articles saying they are, they do, they perform better than humans right now. Fine on that test set, I'm sure they do, but it's always unclear to me. Like, um, what is the thing people say? Like, we we spend a lot of grad, we do graduate student descent on these models, and you know they're probably peeking at the test set and figuring out <laughs> what's wrong. And so you could you might be able to claim in some sense that we've overfit to the test set, and that's why they perform better than humans. Um, but I think this adversarial examples present a problem for that. Uh, type of claim in that, you know, we don't think humans are susceptible to this type of problem. I mean, maybe in the case of like this context attack where, you know, I changed the background and now you perceive it differently, but they're definitely not, humans are, or we're definitely not susceptible to like these patch attacks that I showed. So I don't think they are, and I don't know when they will, we'll see. So I had a question uh, uh, related to that. You, um, the small unseeable perturbation attacks of random, of seemingly almost random small noise across yep. being invisible um, seems like a very brittle attack pattern that okay. a small change, uh, changes to the sensors would 
would see it completely different and would break it. And so when I think about it from a human perspective, every human viewer has different visual acuity. I mean, I'm I'm defective and need glasses with uh, and right. so it would seem like that would make that kind of, it would be a reason why humans are not susceptible to that. But um, these systems are assuming perfect vision. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, the, it's interesting to think about like, what are well, like the sensory information that humans are receiving and how that's any different. And I, I think about that a lot, but we just don't have, it, it's hard for me to think about, okay, how do I make that computational? Cause that's what I need to do at the end of the day. Right. Like I could come up with this nice theory, like, oh, we have persistence of vision and blah, blah, blah. But then how do I turn that into a computation I can actually run yeah. on a neural net? Don't know. <laughs> right. And as John Fitzpatrick pointed out, humans are susceptible just as this image demonstrates. Oh, yeah. And I have um, a whole talk on uh, optical illusions and neural networks because I, I agree that like we're susceptible to these optical illusions. But when I put these optical illusions into neural networks, they see something completely different, essentially. They're not fooled, uh, so to speak. And so these seem like a different class of optical illusions, I guess. Okay.